Well, hello. Uh, we are getting ready to watch the second sermon in our How Do You Do That series, where we are spending some time just really asking the question, how did Paul have such a good attitude in every circumstance he faced when all those circumstances seemed so, so bad? Um, and I, I know we need to figure that out. How do we have joy in our circumstances? That's the question for us. And so that's what this series is all about. Thanks for joining us. We missed you if you weren't able to join us uh, on Sunday morning, but you're welcome to join us next Sunday at 10 o'clock. Well, here we go. Enjoy. Anyway, so today we're going to start into our second series or second sermon in our series called How'd He Do That? How'd He Do That? Last week we started looking at Paul and his letter that he wrote to the Philippians, and we started looking at how Paul could have such a, a content attitude in such an uh, unfamiliar set of circumstances, an inconvenient set of circumstances. How could he be and make statements like he does in Philippians uh, chapter 4, where he says that he's content in every circumstance that he's in? Right. Like, how did he do that? And so last week we talked about the first thing that Paul did is that he made it a priority in his life to pursue God, to get to know God better, that he said he wants to know God and the power of his resurrection. That is his goal. And so, man, I hope and pray that this last week you got to know Jesus better and that you got better acquainted with the power of his resurrection and what that power is able to do in your heart and in your life. That's my prayer. I pray that we continually, every day, day after day, get to know Jesus more and get to understand the power of his resurrection more as that power frees us from our sin, as that power frees us from our brokenness, heals us from our hurts, and just brings to us totally new life, a transformed life. I am praying that we get to know personally and intimately the power of the resurrection of Jesus. But as we get into Philippians, again, I just keep asking, how in the world does Paul have such a great attitude when things aren't easy, when life's not easy, when, when honestly we could sit here and argue, man, you know what, Paul? Life and the things that you're facing right now, dude, that's not easy. That's not even fair. I mean, Paul, his entire life has understood what, it's been, what it was like to be free. He's never been enslaved. I mean, before he came to know Jesus, he knew his freedom. I mean, he was throwing people in jail. He was the one throwing people in prison. He was the one burning people at stakes. Like, he was the one enslaving people. So he's always known his freedom, and now he's a traveling apostle. He's never been tied down, right? He's this guy that travels around giving sermons and equipping leaders and planting churches, and now for him to find himself in prison, having that freedom taken away from him, that's got to be this new, new feeling for him. It's got to be a, it's a, certainly a new circumstance, and I'm just going, how, how in the world, Paul, do you continue to have such, such a positive attitude, right? And, and there's definitely a part of me that goes, well, anybody can come across as having a positive attitude in a letter that you write, right? Like, like I could fake it for a couple of chapters or a couple of pages of writing a letter to some church somewhere. Like, I could fake that. But, but when you read Paul's letters, I don't think anywhere in there is Paul faking it like I don't think Paul's faking anything I think Paul's very genuine about it but with all the changes that have come our way I think that sometimes we feel like we, we may feel like Paul I mean think about it for for Paul having been a traveling apostle having always known your freedom to be in prison probably felt a lot like having your hands tied behind your back have you ever done that have you ever tried to do anything with your hands tied behind your back it's, it's impossible when you're so used to having your hands to use, and then if you end up living life with your hands tied behind your back, you feel, you, you feel useless, like you can't do anything. And there have been moments uh, throughout this whole quarantine where I know I've been like, man, I feel like my hands are tied behind my back, like I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything. You feel a little bit claustrophobic in all of this. And change Change is, is usually not the easiest thing for us to go through, you know, especially if it's a big change. It's not always easy. And when change is forced on us, like it has been, 
it's not an easy thing. And a lot of times, the circumstances that are beyond our control, the change that is beyond our control, those things that happen to us in life, they cause all kinds of emotions to boil up within us, right? And these emotions can get overwhelming, and and we can find ourselves so focused on the emotions that we miss what God wants us to see in that moment. And so, you know, what I would actually like for you to do is, is in the chat right now, I want you, if you can, if you can minimize, uh, summarize in a word or two, some of the feelings that you have felt over the last few weeks, you know, as maybe you have felt like your hands have been tied behind your back, or as you have felt like things have been stolen from you. And maybe you agree with the quarantine. Maybe you disagree with the quarantine. We're not here to debate that today. But what I want you to do is just, in a couple of words, summarize the emotions that you've been feeling. And talk about it. Uh, Paul lost relationships that he can't get back. There's no doubt. Paul wanted to go and be with the church in Philippi, but he couldn't be there. There were churches that Paul wrote letters to that he wanted to go see, but he couldn't get there. There were relationships that Paul wanted to build and people that he wanted to invest in that Paul would never be able to actually invest in in a physical way. Instead, he had to write letters all the time. Man, Paul kind of sounds like he's in a similar situation to what we're in today. We can't be there physically, so we're sending text messages and having to make phone calls, right? I am sure there were many times where Paul, man, was frustrated, angry, upset, sad. Like, what feelings are you going through right now? What are some of those emotions that you have? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you feeling lonely? Are you bored? Um, are you enjoying it? This is a good thing because now I've got a reason to, to get things done around the house and my life's less busy and I have less distractions. Like what are some of those feelings that you're feeling? And I would love for you just to write some of those things in the chat because you know what? There might be someone here in this, in this service right now watching this sermon uh, that maybe is feeling the same way that you're feeling and maybe they feel like they're the only one feeling it. And if you voice how you're feeling, maybe somebody else can come alongside you and say, you know what, I feel that same way. And we need to know if each other's feeling that way so that we can join in together in this challenging time and we can join together in this journey. Paul was writing to a church in Philippi that he felt were his partners. They had been there with him the entire time, through the good times, the bad times. He says, you guys never left my side. They knew him. They were his partners. Folks, I want you to know today that you have partners in this life. You have partners in the body of Christ. We are all partners in this together. And so share where you're at. Share the good things. Share the bad things with one another so that those things don't get overwhelming. And so that then we can let go of some of those things and begin to focus on the things that God has for us. Because you know what? Those emotions and those feelings that we have right now, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, they're real and we need to get them out and we need to feel them and we need to then move on from them and start living in it, right? Start living through it so that we can see what God has for us in this very present moment, even in the midst of our feelings that we have. So as we type those things out, as you express your emotions or frustrations or excitements or joys, man, let's get those things. Let's talk about those things and express those things. But let's not stay there today, okay? So once you've typed those things, come back. Let's focus back on on God's word today. Let's not stay there because if we stay in our anger or we stay in our boredom or we stay in our frustration or we stay in our loneliness, then we're going to miss We're going to miss what God has for us. So let's feel it and acknowledge it. Let's grieve the things that we have missed, the changes that have happened. Let's grieve them if that's what we need to do. Let's celebrate them if that's what we need to do. But then let's move on. And I can't help but feel that's where Paul is in this letter, right? Paul is a prisoner. His hands are tied behind his back. I'm quite sure he has felt some of the very same feelings that you have shared with us today. But Paul didn't let himself stay there. He didn't get stuck in those feelings. He didn't allow himself to become overwhelmed by them. Sometimes we allow those feelings to have more control in us than they should. But he felt them and he said, okay, that's where I'm at. But now where's God? Where's God in all of this? What's God doing in the midst of this? And uh, Paul even went so far as to not let other people 
feel those things for him and stay in those feelings. No doubt this church in Philippi was going, Paul, you're in a bad place. This isn't good, man. Like, we feel for you. You're you're in prison and you shouldn't be. And he found ways, though, to be content in that and then to encourage others because Paul says, you know what? I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing. So Paul ha- acknowledged his circumstances. No doubt Paul acknowledged the feelings and the emotions that went along with those circumstances. But then Paul also found something else to focus on in the midst of those circumstances. And that's what I want us to talk about today. So when I have all these emotions and when I have all these things going on in my life, whether it's because of COVID-19 and the quarantine or whether it's because I've just got some other personal things going on, I've got other circumstances, because let's be honest, COVID-19 is not the only circumstance that we're facing today. COVID-19 is not the only circumstance that you're struggling in today. So don't think this is only about COVID-19, though this is about each and every circumstance that we find ourselves in throughout our entire lives. All of our circumstances create these emotions and these feelings, and we can find ourselves focusing on the circumstances and the emotions and the feelings that keep us down and keep us there, or we can find something else to focus on. And I believe Paul, we can learn from Paul because he has found something else to focus on. So if you go with me to Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read verse 12, then we're going to skip to verses 18 through 20. Here's what it says. Paul says, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Look at that. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, and I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Look at that attitude. Look at his focus. He acknowledges his circumstances. Guys, Let me tell you about my circumstances. And he could have written a book about those circumstances, right? We could he could have made a pretty awesome movie about those circumstances. And if you remember last week when when we looked at Paul, Paul made this bold claim that he'd found a way to be content in every single one of those circumstances. Last week, the circumstances he was specifically talking about were that he learned how to be get along with lots of means. He get learned how to get along with very little means. So whether he had a lot or he had nothing, he could be content because he had God in his life and he was trusting in the power of the resurrection. But now here again, Paul is talking again about circumstances. And so what are these circumstances that he's talking about this week? Well, I think he's about talking about all the circumstances that the church in Philippi is very aware that Paul has had to face in his life. I I think Paul is including all of the events that have transpired here in the last several years of his life. And if you start back in Acts chapter 19, you can start reading through and seeing the things that Paul went through, the circumstances that he faced in his life, and how many times he had to figure out what it looked like to live in a new normal. I mean, there were riots that Paul was at the center of. There was a two-year imprisonment in Caesarea that Paul found himself in. There was an appeal to Caesar as he was in prison. There was threats on his life. There was a trip to Rome that, by the way, ended up in a shipwreck, right? His house arrest, he was re- his freedom was restricted. These are the circumstances that Paul is talking about. Riots, shipwrecks, imprisonments, life-threatening people like this is this is what Paul is facing these are the circumstances that he's dealing with that would make a super exciting movie if if I'm honest right like let's make a movie about Paul's life and it would make great news that's we could report on that all day long but Paul while he had all of these circumstances and all of these exciting things that he could have told people and he could have certainly dwelled on that He could have been like, look at this. Look, look, you guys need to send me more money. You guys need to send me more food. You need to give me more resources because look at what I've been through, right? Like, oh, he could have been so woe is me and probably justified in feeling that way. But he only gives one little blurb about where he's been. 
and he just says, look, look at these circumstances. And he acknowledges, I've had some circumstances. I've been through some things, right? Had some issues, but he doesn't stay there. I mean, they probably knew too well what those circumstances were. But Paul's goal and the goal of this letter was not to get them to better understand his circumstances. Paul's goal was beyond his circumstances. And Paul's purpose of writing this letter, while it was to thank them, it was also to get them to think bigger than their circumstances. It was for them to gain confidence and hope in someone bigger than their circumstances. It was to help them to begin to focus on something, on someone outside of their circumstances. And so the goal wasn't to better understand the circumstance so that they could sulk with him, so that they could feel bad for him. It was to get them to see that God was at work in the midst of those circumstances, right? Our world doesn't really let us get past our circumstances sometimes. Our world doesn't really let us get past those feelings and emotions that those circumstances creep up, uh, cause to creep up in our life. And a lot of times we get stuck there. I mean, that's the reason that I wanted you to type those feelings and those emotions into the chat because I want you to get it out. I want you to acknowledge it. I want you to name it. And I want you to say, this is what it is so that you can say, this is where I'm at. In a way, you're doing what Paul has done. And you're saying to everyone, these are my circumstances, right? This is where I'm at. And the world would say, oh, that's horrible. But God says, yeah, but let me show you something. Let me show you where I'm at in front of, in the middle of those things. So, I mean, if we think about our current circumstances, like you can't get away from those things all the time. They're, they're bomb- our life bombards us with reminding us of those circumstances all over the place. But we could take a lesson from Paul, acknowledge it, and then move on. Paul doesn't stay there. Instead, he quickly shifts his focus to what God is doing through the circumstances that he is in. He, look, he says, he says, here it is. I want you to know my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. That's where his focus is. And that's where he's trying to take, take, take their focus. I appreciate the gifts. I appreciate that you are acknowledging the circumstance that I'm in, right? But I don't want you to stay there. I don't want you to stay in prison with me. I don't want you to stay in my anger or frustration or sadness because all that, that's my circumstance. But what I want you to see is where God is at work in my circumstance so that you can celebrate that with me. All Paul has gone through, all those circumstances that he's been facing, Paul is saying they've turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, that he came to die for us, that he was buried three days later, rose from the grave. He was talking about new life, new kingdom, right? A new king, a new, a, the Savior having come to save us. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying, in my circumstances, have worked to, to advance the gospel. I love that. I think the translation that I went, read says that it was working out for the greater progress of of the gospel. But I like the other translations that translate that to say that those circumstances have actually benefited the advancement of the gospel. Because I, that just paints an awesome picture in my mind. Uh, the Greek speaking world used to describe a, an army that was blazing a trail or someone that was blazing a trail for an army as an advancing army, right? I'm sure you've heard that. I'm sure you've heard that description of an army that's advancing, an advancing army. They are just plowing through. They are just taking over. The picture that I have in my head is a scene from Braveheart of the crazy army advancing. You know the scene that I'm talking about, right? It's this army that's advancing, and they're crazy, and they're yelling, and they're screaming, and it's all these misfits that nobody thinks could ever succeed, that nobody thinks could ever win, and yet here they are advancing on a royal army that they have no business fighting, and they're just going all in, all crazy, ready to go. That's the picture that I have in my head. And so Paul is saying, just like that, he's saying, look, guys, even though I've, got, I've been in these circumstances, God has been using it to advance the gospel. We are a crazy army. You are my partners in this. And we're like this crazy army that's just raw. We're attacking. We're moving forward, right? You can't stop us. We are gaining ground. To me, that's just a powerful 
powerful image that the harder you hit Paul, the further the gospel is advanced. And you know what? I think that's the same for us today. The harder you hit, the further it advances. I mean, look at the areas of the world where the church is persecuted the most, and that's where the church is growing the fastest. The harder you hit, despite the circumstances, the gospel grows. When it comes to the gospel, when it comes to God's plan of redemption, when it comes to spreading the good news of Jesus, the circumstances don't really matter much. They really don't. Because God's message is going to go out no matter what. God's plan is going to be executed no matter what. God's promises will be made good no matter what. Like the circumstances, while they matter to us and they do mess with us and they do impact us and affect us, if we can focus on someone outside of our circumstances, then we have hope that these circumstances only last for a minute but that the ultimate goal and the ultimate truth and the power of the resurrection is going to gain us victory at the end of these circumstances. And we'll just be able to sit back and be like, man, that circumstance, while it was a big deal in the moment, it really, it wasn't that big of a deal because God was in it with me the entire time. And that's what Paul is trying to tell the church in Philippi. I'm so glad you love me. I'm so glad you're supporting me. So glad that you are my partners in this. But no, that these circumstances are not stopping God's work in this place. He tells them in, in verses 13 through 18, the verses I skipped just a little bit ago. He says, My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from my pure motives, thinking to cause me to stress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. In this he rejoices. He doesn't rejoice that he's in prison. He's not rejoicing about his circumstances. He's rejoicing that through his circumstances, the gospel's being advanced, that through his circumstances, that army of God is moving through in some powerful ways, and people are being saved, and the gospel is being preached. That's what Paul is rejoicing about. Everyone now knew there is someone in custody who is going around preaching a new message, preaching a message that the government has, has recognized as being very subversive and threatening to them. So they have him locked up. If we had someone like that in prison here today, we'd know about it. We'd still be talking about it. And since Paul wasn't quiet about his message, since Paul wasn't quiet about his faith, obviously everyone knew what this message was. And so these circumstances led to people who were close to the government. The entire praetorian guard, is what he says, have heard the message of Christ. It doesn't say that they accepted it, but they heard it. And that's part of the battle, right? That's the biggest part. If we can just get the message out, if people could just hear it, That's one step closer to more people having the opportunity to come to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And so he's excited that the entire guard has heard the message of Jesus Christ. So people who are close to the government are now hearing this good news for themselves. And he wouldn't have been able to do that if it weren't for the circumstances. And now they can't ignore it. They're with him every day. They have to hear it. They have to acknowledge him and the message that he's giving. And Paul says, you know what? This is a good thing because they needed to hear about Jesus too. The government needed to hear about Jesus too. The guards needed to hear about Jesus too. And now he says, there's all these other people out in the community that are talking about Jesus. Some are doing it for wrong reasons. Some are doing it for the right reasons. But Paul's going, who cares? Jesus is being talked about. I think the picture I have, too, about this is that, man, you know what? There's people out there walking around going, have you heard about this lunatic? 
Have you heard about this crazy guy? They arrested him because, get this, he was around going around talking about some guy named Jesus who was crucified and supposedly three days later rose from the grave. Can you imagine what this guy's talking about? Right? Like, this guy's crazy. But in this, they're still sharing the gospel. And they're still talking about Jesus. And, and Paul's going, I don't care why they do it. I just care that they're doing it. And as long as people are going around saying that Jesus is died on the cross and rose from the, from the grave and that I'm telling them that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and that he is Lord, I'm good with that, right? Paul is excited because the message is going out. He is rejoicing because God is working through him and through his circumstances. We have the same choice to make. In every circumstance that we face, we, may, we have a choice to make. We can focus on the circumstance. We can focus on how unhappy we are to be in that circumstance. We can focus on how angry we are, how bored we are, how frustrated we are. We can focus on how excited we are to be in that circumstance, how great the circumstances is. Like we can, no matter what, good or bad, we can focus on the circumstance. That's our choice. Or we can choose to acknowledge this is good, this is bad, this is, makes me angry, this makes me happy. We can acknowledge that and then say, but where's God at work through this circumstance? Where's God working through me in this circumstances? See, Paul said these circumstances have caused greater advancement of the gospel. And he celebrated that. He wasn't focused on the circumstance. He was focused on where God was at work in the circumstance and when we start to focus on where god is at work in the circumstance we get to redefine that circumstance we also then get to redefine how we feel about that circumstance so with this new focus came a new definition of success and a reinterpretation of the circumstance he was facing he could have said man you know what i really messed up if you weren't aware of this when Paul started the church in Philippi, it started in a girl's house named Lydia. And just as Paul led Lydia and her family to Christ, Paul got annoyed at some um, girl that was prophesying around him, and he actually cast the demon out of her, which led to his arrest. And Paul could have said, I'm in these, some of these circumstances have been my fault. I'm a failure. I messed up. I got annoyed and cast a demon out, and now I'm in prison. Like, he could have focused on the reason he was in the circumstances. He could have talked about blaming this person, blaming that person, blaming himself for his circumstances. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he says, I'm going to redefine this circumstance, and I'm going to redefine my feelings about it. And I'm going to do that by focusing on where God is at work in these circumstances. And then instead of being down and out about these circumstances, I'm going to rejoice in them because God's at work through them. And that's what's exciting. Paul didn't live for the circumstances. Paul lived for God. The circumstances didn't change that. Paul lived for God despite the circumstances, whether he had a lot, whether he had a little, whether he was in prison or whether he was free. It didn't change the fact that he lived for God no matter what the circumstance. And when you live for God, no matter what the circumstance, you'll always have reason to rejoice. When you trust God for your deliverance, you will always have reason to rejoice. Paul said, I know that these circumstances, I know that I'm, th this is going to work out for my deliverance through your prayers. Now, Paul didn't have in his mind that he thought God was going to take the circumstances away or miraculously free him from prison. Paul said, I, I'm going to be delivered through these circumstances, and it's either going to be through life or through death. But again, it didn't matter because Paul was living for God. He said, in all of this, I can rejoice because I know that it's working out for the greater good of God's plan in this place. That was the only thing he was focused on, the advancement of the gospel, the advancement of God's plan. And if we are going to keep moving forward through our circumstances, we've got to refocus on, on him and how he's working through those things. We can be content in every circumstance that we're in. 
when we rest in the power of the resurrection of Jesus, when we depend on him for the strength to make it through and the resources we need to make it through. We can be content in every circumstance that we're in when we take time and opportunity to refocus ourselves on how God is working through those circumstances and look for the things that we can rejoice in in God's work around those circumstances. Look at the current circumstance that we're in. We are facing an unprecedented time with a no apparent end date, right? Uh, But look at what God is doing through the circumstances. Let's take a minute to redefine the circumstances. Let's take a minute to redefine our feelings towards these circumstances. Check this out. Like, if you start to really look at it, it's amazing how God is working it through these things. You're familiar, most of us are probably familiar with that trillion, some odd trillion dollar uh, relief package that the government signed into law. And many of you probably got your stimulus checks deposited because of this relief package. And many of you have already uh, shared how much of a blessing that's been and how you're going to use that to bless others. Like, that's amazing. Now the church, the people of the church have been given a resource, many of which needed that resource, many of which don't necessarily need it, but they're going to use it to still bless someone else that does. That's awesome. The government has equipped you with a resource to bless people in the midst of this circumstance. Then there's this CARES Act. And this CARES Act, the, there's loans for small businesses, but part of that CARES Act is also for nonprofits, which includes churches. And as long as you fit the criteria as far as being able to prove that your income has been impacted by this virus, small businesses, nonprofits alike, you can apply for a grant that can pay for utilities and staff. I know of a number of churches that have applied for this grant. So if they get this grant, the government's going to be paying for their operation costs. The government's going to be paying for their ministry. How amazing is that? How awesome is that? With no strings attached, the government will be paying for the advancement of the gospel. That's amazing. I mean, look in your own family right now and the connections that you've made. Maybe you're talking to people that you haven't talked to in forever. Maybe you're building relationship with people that you've never really built a relationship with. I know one of the things that I really am rejoicing in in this circumstance is the connection that we've been able to build. There are a lot of people, even within Central, that I feel more connected to right now than ever before because I'm not just saying, hi, how are you, on a Sunday morning. We're actually having a conversation on the phone or we're texting back and forth. Like, that's amazing. That's awesome. The church has already reached more people the last few weeks than it would have had it not been for our current circumstances. And I'm not talking about just Central. I'm talking about the church worldwide. Some stats from the church that puts together this online platform. They've been putting this online platform that's been around for quite some time, years and years, right? Life Church was one of the first churches that started this online platform that started digital ministry. They were one of the pioneers in that world. Well, a few weeks ago when this virus hit, the church online platform exploded. And in one weekend, they added 6,000 more churches to their platform. For free, 6,000 more churches. Now, granted, most all of those churches were forced to that platform because of the circumstances, right? We could gripe about that. But in that, 4.7 million people watched a church service online through the online platform in one weekend. 4.7 million users joined in on a church service thanks to the addition of those 6,000 more churches. In one weekend, the weekend that we had problems, not last weekend, but a couple weekends before, there were 17,000 church services on the church online platform. So, man, the church doors didn't close, right? Thousands of churches opened all across the world, all across the country, in every home that logged in. Your home right now is a church. Your home is a church today. God just planted a church in your neighborhood, and it's in your house. How awesome is that? My podium moved from the stage at Southe- in Southeast Portland right there off of Powell, and now my podium, come to find out, is my computer in this microphone and, and outside in my backyard. And we get to preach, and we get to teach, and we get to be together in that in every home 
all over the place. And the most exciting part is, I don't know when this, when this happened, if it was last weekend or the weekend before, but 16,000 new decisions for Jesus were reported on the online platform. 16,000 new decisions for Jesus. Now, I don't know what that would have looked like without the circumstances that we currently face, but there are plenty of reasons for us to rejoice today. To redefine our circumstances. To redefine how we feel about these things. And instead rejoice because God's at work through them. God's at work through us in all of these circumstances. So we can complain if we want. We can grieve if we want. We can be angry if we want. But don't stay there. Type those feelings into a chat and then rejoice. Rejoice in those things. And so let's do that right now. Rejoice. Type your reasons for rejoicing today in the chat. Type your reasons for being excited about what God is doing through your circumstances today. Type it. Give a sentence. Give two sentences. Give one word. Give two words about how God's at work. Let's celebrate together. We mourned together at the beginning of the service. We grieved together our circumstances. You know, we shared the emotions that we've had. And now we get to celebrate what God's doing through these circumstances. So really type that in, share it, write it on there so that everybody can see, yes, you're right. Maybe you're sharing your redefining of this circumstance. Maybe you're sharing your praise of how God's at work through this circumstance will be just what somebody else needs to see, what somebody else needs to hear. Maybe there's someone watching today that we don't know is even watching because they haven't said hi in the chat yet, right? Because we know there's people that haven't said hi And maybe that person needs to see what you have to say. Let's celebrate today what God is doing through these circumstances. Let's redefine our circumstances, whether it be virus-related or just life-related. Let's redefine it and look for the ways that God is working through these circumstances. Because I want you to know that God is always at work through your circumstances. Whether your circumstances are good or whether they are bad, it doesn't matter. God's at work through them. Let's have the same attitude that Paul had. And let's all say, just as Paul said, I want you to know that God is working, that my circumstances, our circumstances, has led to our spiritual growth, has led to an increase in our faith, has led to a more amazing and stronger testimony, that our circumstances have led to the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my life, in my family's life, in my co-workers' lives, in my school's lives, in my community's life, in my city, in my country. The circumstances have led to the advancement of the gospel. Circumstances never stop God's work in your life. Paul expressed confidence early in his letter to the Philippians that he was confident that the work God started them, he would finish it. God finishes what he starts. Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. Even if it's not a fun circumstance, God works for good through that circumstance. And God has started a work in you today, and your circumstances won't change that. God is working through your circumstances. Have hope in him today. Trust in him today. And if you haven't trusted in him yet, then today is your day. Trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ today because he died for you in the midst of your circumstances so that he could work through you and in them. Surrender your lives to God. Redefine your circumstances in Christ. Rejoice because God's at work in every situation that we face ourselves. Paul has given us that challenge and that hope today, and I pray that we hang on to it. I pray that we apply it and that we go out and live it. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today. Thank you for Paul's challenge or Paul's encouragement. Thank you, God, for this word that Paul has given to his church in Philippi and that now we are receiving, that in our circumstances, you're still at work. God, I don't know what circumstances have been represented here today, but I know, God, that you're at work in them. Help us to to redefine them. Help us to see them differently. Help us to be transformed in them and be used by them for the advancement of your kingdom in our hearts and in our lives and in our world. God, if there be anybody here today that doesn't know you, that has yet to experience your goodness and your grace, your forgiveness, God, I pray that today be the day they experience that for themselves. Would you just have your way with us, Lord God? 
and move in this place. Give us a great rest of this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I am just praying that God really spoke to you through that message today, that God's using Paul's life and Paul's letter to the Philippians to really just encourage you. I, I'm praying that we all find uh, contentment in the power of the resurrection of Christ, that we find victory in the power of his resurrection, and that we also find ways to rejoice in our circumstances, that no matter what circumstances we face, God's with you today. God will never leave you or forsake you. And I would love for you to take an ch- opportunity and connect with us, chat with us, uh, leave a message here, or send us an email, give us a phone call, fill out our connection card, whatever uh, you're comfortable with. But just reach out to us, connect with us. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to join you in your journey. We'd love to join you in whatever circumstance you're facing so that you feel like, you know what, I've got a partner in this. We'd love to be your partner in your life and in your circumstances. So, so reach out, connect with us. We'd love to join with you in that and see what God is doing in your life and what God wants to do through your circumstances. But thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Know that we're praying with you. Know that God is with you no matter what's going on in your life.